this lecture we will uh, repeat something about what we spoke last year in the lecture about the chemical composition of blood plasma for plasma that's water ions and so on and also something about what we spoke yesterday for we had kidneys yes and kidneys play important role in the regulation of both water and minerals in the body yes Do you know what is internal environment? What does it mean, this term? For it's widely used in clinic. Yes, internal environment means the composition of liquid surrounding cells. Yes, so we can say that it's the extracellular fluid. Yes, but doctors are speaking about the internal environment. Yes, it's a very important function uh, for you know our cells want to be in the water that has, or in the liquid that has constant volume, constant composition, yes? If you change the amount of this liquid or the composition of this liquid, it will harm the cells, yes? And therefore the composition and the amount of internal environment is very important functions function and all doctors should know how it looks like the internal environment of his patient. Yes, it's same important as the blood pressure, as the heart frequency, as the blood tem body temperature. Yes, so the composition and amount of internal environment is very important. Our cells want this internal environment to be stable. Yes. They want to have stable volume or constant volume of this fluid that we call isovolumia. There should be constant osmolarity or tonicity. It means isosmolarity. Stable composition, it means ionic composition. It means isoionia. <coughs> and the fourth balance that we want to keep is the constant concentration of hydrogen proteins. It means constant pH. That's called isohydria. Yes? In this lecture, we will speak about these three balances. It means how the body keeps stable volume, it means stable amount of water. How the body keeps the stable osmolarity. It means stable amount of osmotic active particles and the stable amount of ions, it means isoionia, yes? Next lecture on Monday, next week, we'll speak about this, about the acid-base balance, how the body keeps stable concentration of hydrogen proteins. <coughs> so we will start about the water. This is repetition about this we spoke last year. You know that in a in our body, we have about 60% of water, yes? That water forms 55 to 60% of body mass, yes? That we call total body water or whole body water, yes? But you know that this amount differs, that sometimes we have more water and sometimes we have less water. The younger we are, the more water we have. Yes, newborns have. If you are small, the younger you are, the more water you have. The newborns have about 80% of water in their body. Yes? The older you are, the less water you have. Yes? So. Old persons have, for example, 40%. Not the 60, but they have 40, yes? And the older, the less water. So you can say that during your life, you lose water. Women have less body water than men. Why? They have more fat. They have more fat. Fat is lipophilic compound. And you know that lipids like to be together, but they hate water. Yes? Therefore, fat persons or obese persons, they have also less water. Yes? 
if you have a person with 200 kilograms, you are sure that the total body content is not 60%, but it's about 40%, yes? For 200 kilograms, that's more than 100 kilogram of fat, and there is no water inside. Also, during pregnancy, women have more water than normal. Very often, at the end of pregnancy, women develop edema, yes? For during pregnancy, there is a retention of sodium and water in the body. Yes, so pregnant women, they have more uh, water than normal women. Also repetition is that you know that water can be in two compartments, in two body compartments. In the intracellular space, that we call intracellular fluid, and in extracellular space, it means extracellular fluid. In adults, Intracellular fluid makes two thirds of whole body water, and the rest, it means one third, is for extracellular fluid. And 25% of this extracellular fluid is in veins. We call it intravasal fluid, it's plasma and lymph. Yes? And 75% of the extracellular fluid we have as an interstitial fluid, it means fluid in the tissues, yes? Sometimes these numbers are expressed in this, yes, in the percent of body mass. So if the whole body water has 60%, then intracellular fluid is 40% of total body weight, and extracellular fluid is 20% of whole body weight, yes? That you have here written. Some books prefer this expression. But in our body, we do not have only intracellular and extracellular fluid. We have also fluid in the third space. What is it, the third space? Yes, so we have some normal cavities in our body, yes, and in these cavities we have water, yes. One example is cerebrospinal fluid. This fluid is in the subarachnoidal space, yes. It surrounds our central nervous system, our brain and spinal cord. We have about 150 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid. then all fluid that we have in gastrointestinal tract. Gastrointestinal tract is also search space. And you know that per day we produce about seven to nine liters of digestive juices, and all of them are fluids in search space. Then we have sino, uh, sinoveal fluid, and then fluid in pleural, pericardial, and peritoneal cavity, yes? So the water in the body can also accumulate here, yes? For example, if the, if the water accumulates in peritoneal cavity, we call it, do you know how? How we call the accumulation of water in peritoneal cavity? Acetes, yes? Now, why we have two sorts of water and one sort of water, one in intracellular and, one, and the other in the extracellular fluid? You know that the movement of water in the body is passive. There is no active transporter for water. The molecules that enable uh, transport of water are called aquaporines. Yes, and aquaporines enable transport of water between the compartments. Yes? And the movement of water is driven by some force, and the force is called osmotic pressure. That's the pressure of osmotic active particles. Yes? We express it as the osmolarity. Osmolarity 
is other way how to express the concentration. Yes, it has values millimoles per liter or milliosmoles. It's the same thing. And osmolarity means the number of osmotic active particles per one liter. Yes, you know that we also have osmolality. There it's in one kilogram. Yes, but we will use only the osmolarity. Yes, so it means number of osmotic active particles per one liter of the fluid. Normal range of the osmolarity in our body is 280 to 295. Yes, millimoles. And majority of this value is influenced by the low molecular weight compounds. It means by some small compounds, by ions, cations and anions, by nutrients, and then by waste products. If you know this, you can calculate the osmolarity. Yes, you as a doctor, for normally from the lab, you do not gain the result of osmolarity, but only the result of basic ions, basic <coughs> nutrients, and basic waste products. Yes, but the lab do not calculate the osmolarity. But you as a doctor, you can calculate it, for you know that the osmolarity is influenced by ions, nutrients, and metabolites. So you take the main representative from these groups. For ions, you take sodium, and you multiply it by two. Why by two? Yes, for if you have sodium, it uh, has positive charge. It has to be accompanied by some anion in the same amount. You know that in extracellular fluid, is sodium a Accompanied by chlorides and by bicarbonate. Yes? Then we take the metabolite with the highest concentration, that's urea. You know that we have about 2.8 to 8 millimoles of urea per liter in plasma. Yes? So this is the representative of the metabolite. And the glucose is the representative of nutrients. It has the highest concentration, yes? So from these three values, you can calculate the osmolarity and we call it calculated osmolarity. Very useful for the doctor can be if you calculate something that's called osmotic gap. The osmotic gap you gain if you have the measured osmolarity, it means the osmolarity from the lab, minus the osmolarity that you calculate. Normally the osmotic gap is quite small, it's about 10, yes? The osmotic gap, that's all other compounds that are not in this formula, yes? So there is, for example, potassium, then some amino acids, some other waste products as creatinine, uric acid, and so on, yes? Normally it's about 10, 15. The osmotic gap. But if you measure this, you calculate according to this formula and you gain osmotic gap 40. What it will tell you about the patient. If the osmotic gap is not normal, it means 15 for example, but it's 40. Yes, so it can be waste products, but in general it tells to you in plasma is something that's osmotic active and it's not the normal sodium, urea, or glucose. Yes? Is it 10 normal? <coughs> 10, 15, yes. The normal range is about, I think, 10 to 15, but you know, if the significant increase of osmotic gap is higher than 20. Yes? Below 20, it still can be normal. Yes? When it's higher than 20, you know that something is better. Yes? This is very often used in urgent medicine or at the resuscitation units or 
intensive care unit, if they bring to them some patient, very often the patient is unconscious, and they have suspicion that there is some poisoning. Yes, for example, ethanol poisoning, methanol poisoning, or ethyl and glycol poisoning. Yes? All these compounds are osmotic active, and if there is this poisoning, you will see in, that the plasma osmolarity is very, very high. But these values are still normal. So you gain big gap. So the osmotic gap tells you only that you have something in blood in very high concentration that is able to change the osmolarity. Yes? This cannot tell you, for example, about some poisoning of very effective compounds. Yes. Of course, the benzodiazepines, for example, do also unconsciousness, but they are very effective in small concentrations, <coughs> and they absolute they cannot affect the osmotic gap. Yes. What's, what's the difference in the procedure between measuring uh, and calculating? Measured, it means that in the lab they will <coughs> measure the osmolarity. Calculated is this osmolarity. Yeah, how do you do? Like you from the lab you gain results of basic ions, it means sodium, results of basic waste product, it's creatinine, sometimes uric acid, but it has to be urea there. So you gain the urea, and from metabolites you measure glucose. So from the lab you gain these three values. You can calculate the osmolarity and then you ask the lab to, to measure the osmolarity. So you have the measured value, you calculate the, this value, or the lab can calculate it also, and you have the osmotic gap. So it tells you that in the blood is something that affects the osmolarity and it's not sodium urea glucose and the normal compounds. Yes? Not, uh, but basic, it measures, the lab normally measures sodium, potassium, chloride, urea, creatinine, sometimes uric acid, and glucose. So many times you will, you will get the answer directly from the lab, what is... For example, for type 1 diabetes, you will gain the answer. For you will see that the concentration of glucose is 40. And therefore, the osmolarity of plasma will be 330. Yes, but very often it happens that you have some patient, you have only the basic values, and now you have to distinguish. So I think that majority of these patients have ethanol, yes, or methanol <laughs> due to some of the patient's history. And of course that you can measure it directly in the lab, but easier and faster is to do this. And if you see you have suspicion this patient is drunk, and you see that there is no normal osmotic gap, you know it's not. It can be, for example, the benzodiazepines. So you will measure benzodiazepines and not alcohol, ethanol. Yes? So this value is only screening. Yes? The same I will tell you in next lecture, where we have an ion gap. Yes? It will be very similar. It's a screening method, very fast. It cannot tell you the end diagnosis, but it can show you the way how to go to it. Yes, normal, millimoles. That's the rest what's not in this formula. It means potassium, it means creatinine, uric acid, amino acids. Yes, what's not in the formula. And pathologic values are higher than uh, 40. Oh, sorry, higher than 20. Yes. But for example, if you have two promila, after ethanol, you have the gap 40. Yes? You have very high osmolarity if you are drunk. How the osmolarity is regulated? You know, osmolarity is strictly regulated. Yes? Normally, per day, the changes can be only to 2%. Yes? No greater, yes? If everything is okay, the changes of osmolarity are very, very mild. If you compare it, for example, to glucose, that in the morning before breakfast, you can have glucose 3.8, and after a meal, after a lunch, you can have six. So you see two times higher value, almost. 
And here, the variability can be also only 2%. Yes? So, osmolarity is very strictly regulated by the body. Yes? Why? I will tell you later. Osmolarity is regulated by the manipulation of free water. Pure water, it means without solutes. For that's the only way how you can change the, concentra uh, the osmolarity. You know, students during exam very often say that osmolarity is, for example, regulated by aldosterone. For aldosterone, does the movement of water together with sodium. But that cannot change the osmolarity for you transport ions together with water. So the osmolarity is still the same. The only possibility how to change the osmolarity is to separate the transport of ions and the transport of water. Yes? And in the body is done that in the uh, collecting duct, you can transport free water without ions. It means you can decrease the osmolarity if you reabsorb this free water. Yes? Therefore, aldosterone is not a hormone that can regulate osmolarity. It can regulate the amount of water in the body, that's true, but not the osmolarity. The main hormone that regulates osmolarity is antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. That's the synonymous. And we have simple feedback. The regulation is very easy. We spoke about it a bit last lecture, so I will repeat it. Antidiuretic hormone is produced in hypothalamus, yes? You know hypothalamus, that's the head of our autonomous nerve system, yes? And hypothalamus controls many crucial functions in our body. Osmolarity is one of them, yes? So when the blood flows through the hypothalamus, through some nucleus, the cells in hypothalamus can analyze the blood and see what's the osmolarity. Yes, we call these cells osmoreceptors. If they see that the osmolarity is high, higher than normal, they secrete antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is peptide hormone, so the secretion can be very fast. To make it more difficult, antidiuretic hormone is not directly secreted in hypothalamus, but it's secreted in pituitary gland in the posterior lobe, yes? So there has to be transport of antidiuretic hormone to the posterior lobe of pituitary gland, yes? In, in pituitary gland, antidiuretic hormone is released and it's in our bloodstream and it binds to its receptor. In collecting duct, we have V2 receptors for antidiuretic hormone. And the mechanism is simple. When antidiuretic hormone binds to the receptor, it increases the concentration of second messenger, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And this is a signal for vesicles that have in their membrane aquaporines, aquaporine type 2. So it means antidiuretic hormone, means incorporation of aquaporines to the apical membrane, and through the aquaporines, the water can go in the cell and then to the kidney medulla, where you have hyperosmolar environment due to action of Henle's loop. So the only action of osmosopressin in kidneys is the incorporation of aquaporines. Where can we find aquaporins one? Aquaporin 1 is almost in all our body. It was first discovered on our red blood cells, but we know that aquaporin 1 is aquaporin that is almost in all cells. Yes. Aquaporin 2 is more specific for the kidneys, but also the aquaporin 2 you can find in other cells. What's typical? Almost all our cells have aquaporins normally in the membrane. Cells in collecting duct, they have 
almost non evaporine unless there is antidiuretic hormone. Yes? Excuse me. Is the kidney the only target of vasopressin? Not. In two minutes, I will speak about the second target. For we have V1 receptor also. Uh, so you see here, no ions, only water. So the result is more free water to the body. It means you have low, or you lower the osmolarity. Yes, so antidiuretic hormone decreases the osmolarity. Here we have described the process. There was the question whether antidiuretic hormone has some other action in the body. It's true, but it's a bit bad action for the osmolarity. You know, antidiuretic hormone is typical stress hormone, yes? When you have some stress situation, our body reacts very simple. It activates the stress axis, it has some neuronal part and some hormonal part. The hormonal part of stress axis consists of three main hormones, or four main hormones. It's catecholamines, glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and antidiuretic hormone. So you can say that in all stress situations, you secrete antidiuretic hormone. One stress situation for the body is, for example, low blood pressure, yes? If you have low blood pressure, it means you have lack of fluid in the vessels. You want to put their fluid, yes? And, anti sorry, and antidiuretic hormone can give the water to the vessels, yes? For it, reabsorb water. But the problem is that here the signal is not the osmolarity. Yes, but still, antidiuretic hormone has the effect in kidneys. Yes, on the V2 receptors. V1 receptors of antidiuretic hormone are in blood vessels, in pre arterioles, and they do the vasoconstriction. That's V1 receptor. V2 receptor is in kidneys. So, what happens when you have low blood pressure? You does the vasoconstriction and also you absorb free water in the kidneys. But the problem here is that your osmolarity at the beginning was normal. Your only problem was some stress situation, for example, hypertension. So here, the effect of antidiuretic hormone in kidneys can harm the body, for, for it will still decrease the concentration, it will still decrease the osmolarity. You can develop, uh, especially in critical stages for low blood pressure is for example, typical for polytrauma after car accident, you can develop very, very low osmolarity. Yes, due to the antidiuretic hormone. Yes, for the body wants to save the blood pressure to keep the perfusion of organs, and it doesn't matter that you have low osmolarity, yes, for the body. Unfortunately, <coughs> the brain can be damaged by the hyposmolarity, yes. Therefore, today we have a selective antagonist of V2 receptors, and sometimes on resuscitations unit, they have to give these blockers to the patients, yes? For the effect on the cardiovascular system is positive to increase the blood pressure, but you have to cancel the effect in kidneys, yes? So antidiuretic hormone is crucial for the regulation of osmolarity, but you see that if there is disbalance, that it can harm the body. You know, you as a doctor, you don't want to play with the osmolarity, yes? For if the patient comes to the hospital, you don't want to produce new problem, yes? And you know that almost all patients in hospital, they have some infusions. If you have to decide what infusion you want to give to the patient, the easiest way is to give the infusion that has the same osmolarity as 
patient. Yes, it's the plasma of patient. These solutions that have the same osmolarity we call isotonic solutions. Here we have several examples of them. Yes, normal saline that you know it's not normal for it consists only of sodium and chlorides. Better are these balanced solutions, Ringer or Hartmann solution, for they have the ionic composition similar to the plasma ionic composition. Yes? Of course, that in some situations, you have to give not isotonic solutions by hypertonic or hypotonic solution. Yes, but you have to know why to do this. For if you give a lot of hypotonic solutions to the patient, there will be disbalance between the osmolarity in cell, in inter, uh, intracellular space, and the osmolarity in extracellular space, yes, that you changed by the infusion. And if the change of osmolarity is very, very fast, cells cannot prepare for this change, and the process will be that the water will go along the osmotic pressure into the cell. Yes? So if you give a lot of hypotonic solutions, you decrease the osmolarity, the free water will go into the cells and you will develop what? Cell, ed cell edema. If we are speaking about erythrocytes, they, there can be a rupture of their membranes and we call it hemolysis. Yes? Uh, the hemolysis we can see quite nice, yes. More or bigger problem is the edema of brain, yes. For the same thing, we have not only edema of erythrocytes, but we have also edema of astrocytes, of neurons, yes. And you know that our skull cannot be bigger, so the brain is compressed in the skull, yes. And that's the bigger problem what a patient can have when you very fastly decrease the osmolarity, yes? So the brain edema. But also the changes of osmolarity in the other direction, it means if you give a lot of, a lot of uh, hypertonic solutions aren't good. For, it's especially toxic for our brain, for our myelin sheets need to have the proper osmolarity, yes? And a very especially harmful for them is high osmolarity that drains water from them. Yes, if you have very high uh, osmolarity or very fast change in the osmolarity, you develop something that's called osmotic demyelinization. Yes, in general, you destroy the myelin sheets, especially you can see in uh, in the brain steam. Yes, in Pons virally, you can say it, yes? So it's not good to play with osmolarity in both directions, not to decrease, not to increase. The best thing is to keep it, <coughs> yes? The question is why you can fight patient that has osmolarity 340 and he has no problem. Very often to the hospital comes patient that has osmolarity 340 and he has no demyelinization. Yes, it was not rapid. If you have slow change of osmolarity, the cells can <coughs> prevent the damage for they change their osmolarity also, yes? If you decrease the extracellular osmolarity slowly, the cells will excrete their ions and other osmotic particles to decrease their own osmolarity also. On the other hand, if you have for example, higher osmolarity due to glucose in type 1 diabetes, and the increase is slow, the cells will retain the ions inside to maintain the balance, yes? The problem is if you fast decrease the osmolarity or fastly increase the osmolarity. That is the problem. But the slow changes you can do. So this here, here we have what I spoke about. So the question to osmolarity and about the isosmia, how to regulate osmolarity. 5% glucose, is that isotonic or hypotonic? According to the calculation, it's isotonic, but the problem is that, uh, you know, 
if you give the glucose, the glucose will be consumed by the cells. The end product is carbon dioxide and water. So at the end, you give with the 5% glucose only pure water. Yes? For the solution, is isotonic, if you calculate. But if the glucose is metabolized, you gain only water. So the final effect is hypotonic. So very often, if you have patient with some dehydration, you give together 5% glucose and some balanced solution. Yes? The balanced solution to keep the, uh, the osmolarity stable and the 5% glucose slowly to decrease the osmolarity. Yes? So very often these two solutions are given together. Yes, on first two hours glucose, the next two hours balanced solution. So that was about, uh, about the osmolarity. Now about the volume, so the isovolumia. So how to keep the volume? The volume of water in our body is controlled by the amount of sodium in our body. Yes? For sodium is the main extracellular, <coughs> extracellular uh, cation. And where you have sodium, there you have water. Yes? If you want to lose, if you want to lose water, it, the water has to go through the extracellular compartment. It means the sodium has to release this water. Yes? So therefore, the amount of water in our body is controlled by the amount of sodium in our body. For where you have sodium, there you have water. Yes? And therefore, the sodium influences a lot of other parameters. They're dependent on the amount of water in the body. Yes? All hemodynamic parameters, as for example, blood, blood pressure, heart frequency, are dependent on the amount of intravascular water. And this amount is controlled by the sodium. Yes? So the total volume is controlled by the sodium content. Sodium is the main extracellular cation. The concentration is about 140 millimoles. In cells, we have lower concentration. Yes, there is about eight. So you see big gradient between extracellular and intracellular space. <coughs> You know, when we are speaking about sodium, still we have to keep in mind that sodium is accompanied not only by water, but also by some anion, yes? So sodium cooperates with chlorides, and they cooperate, it cooperates also with bicarbonate, yes? So you can say that sodium plus respective anions are responsible for about 80-85% of the osmolarity of extracellular space. And the amount of water of this extracellular space determines the hemodynamic parameters. So if the question is what's the role of sodium in the body, you can say its role is to keep the balance of volume of water in the body, to keep the normal breath pressure, to keep the cardiac output. Yes, that's the role of sodium. And also there are other roles as to do the actual potential. Where we gain so sodium, it's quite simple. We take it especially in a salt, yes? Recommended doses are about 2.4 grams of sodium per day it makes about six gram of salt per day. What do you think is the amount of salt in Western diet? 20 in McDonald's or Burger King. If you eat only in Burger King, the whole meal, then you have about 20 grams of salt per day. No, uh, the normal is about 10 to 12, yes? It's about, in Czech Republic, it's about 10 to 12 grams of sodium. One meal in McDonald's? One meal or the whole diet? No, uh, the, if you eat only there, in, only in McDonald's. The whole diet, if you will, whole day, if you eat only in McDonald's, it makes about 20 grams of salt. 
and therefore also the meal is there so tasty yes not only for there is a lot of fat and so on but the salt we like salt we as a human beings yes for during the evolution there was lack of salt yes so if you have something with salt it tastes better for us yes uh, this in balance so recommended maximum six grams but normally we take much much more that can be the problem and therefore there was light by theory about how why we have hypertension yes the theory is quite simple you know that blood pressure is regulated by the amount of intravascular fluid Intravascular fluid is determined by sodium, so if you eat more sodium than you should, you have to have hypertension, yes? Uh, now we know that this theory is not so simple, that the theory of hypertension is not so simple. From the studies we know that the more salt you eat, the higher frequency of hypertension you have. That's true. But there are some steps in the middle, yes, something between, for of course the amount of sodium is regulated in the body yes but it's true that the more sodium the more hypertension yes so how the body regulates the amount of sodium it cannot regulate what you eat of course for salt is tasty so there has to be some hormones that regulate especially the excretion or the reabsorption of sodium. There are two main systems. First system is renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. This system does the retention of sodium. Other system is the system of natriuretic polypeptides. And this system increases excretion of sodium. Yes, natriuresis. Uh, do you remember this whole system from the lecture about kidneys? So, do you want I to repeat it or not? No. no. Good. So, only keep in mind that not only aldosterone is the active hormone, renin is also active hormone, and angiotensin type 2 is also very active hormone. Yes? So, all of these hormones somehow regulate the sodium in the body, but it's true that the aldosterone is the strongest. Yes, it's the strongest signal for sodium retention and excretion of potassium. Uh, in what way is renin important? For it's lower. Yes, it's renin is uh, created when you have lower flow in the kidney tubules. And also if, there, if you are missing sodium there, yes? And the renin has its receptor. It's true that renin is more, or these receptors, the renin receptors are more important for the regulation of blood con uh, pressure uh, at the level of vasoconstriction. But we also know that the renin receptors are in the distal tubule. Not many of them, yes. Aldosterone is the key in the distal tubule, but all this, all this system does something in the kidneys, yes? It's true that renin plus angiotensin type 2, they do more vasoconstriction, and aldosterone does more reabsorption of sodium, yes? Natural, uh, excretion of natrium. I will go to that. So here we have the system of natriuretic polypeptides. You should know about two representatives. The first is atrial natriuretic polypeptide. It was first discovered, yes? The second is brain natriuretic polypeptide. Yes, so about these two natriuretic hormones you should know. Atrial natriuretic polypeptide and brain natriuretic polypeptide. Both of them increases the, nat the natriuresis. It means the excretion of sodium from the body. Together with sodium, you excrete water. When they are released, they are released in our heart. 
Yes? So it's quite strange that heart is our endocrine organ, but it's true. Heart secretes many hormones. Here we have two representatives. Atrial natriuretic polypeptide is released in atria, and brain natriuretic polypeptide is released where? The name brain is not true, unfortunately. But where in the heart? One in atria, so the other will be in? Ventricle. In ventricles, yes. So the brain in ventricles, atrial natriuretic polypeptide in atrias. But both of them are released in the same state when you have more blood than it's normal, yes. So it means when the venous returns, so it means the amount of blood that flows in the heart is bigger than normal and you have dilatation of the heart, yes? But they are released in different part of heart, yes? So these two systems, they regulate the amount of sodium in the body and therefore they also influence the amount of water in the body. You know, we press to you that you should know very good the laboratory values of ions, nutrients, waste products in the body, yes, in the plasma. Uh, in, uh, to know the plasma concentration of ions have some limitations. For the problem is that the plasma concentration tells you only about the concentration <coughs> per some liter, per some amount, yes? But very often you want to know the total amount of the ion in the body, yes? For the total amount of sodium tells you about the total amount of water in the body. And for, from the plasma concentration, you cannot say the amount of sodium in the body, yes? The same you will see for potassium, yes? The laboratory values are for you important for the laboratory values influences, for example, the um, stability of the excitatory tissues, the actual potential, yes? But these values cannot tell you nothing about the total body stores of the ions. If you want to assess the stores or the total stores of sodium in the body, you have to use other methods. And the methods are quite simple. It's the basic clinical examination. And why? For if you have a lot of sodium, you have a lot of water. So you have to find some signs on the patient that he has a lot of water. If the patient is missing sodium, he is missing water, and you will see lack of water on the patient. Yes? So lack of sodium, it means decreased volume of extracellular fluid. You can see by the signs. The easiest sign is the tachycardia, yes? If you have lack of intravascular fluid and you want to keep the cardiac output, it means the amount of blood that is pumped by the heart per minute, you have lack of blood, so the heart has to do many more beats. Therefore, you have tachycardia, higher blood frequency, heart frequency. Other sign is orthostatic hypotension. What is it? Yes. When you stand up, you can collapse, have a collapse, yes? For if you have lack of uh, intravascular fluid and you stand up, then the fluid will still be in your legs and you aren't able to do the perfusion of brain. Yes, so it's a very good sign also. And here are the other signs of dehydration. If you have if the total amount of sodium in the body is higher, it means you have more fluid in the body. The easy sign is that you will see the edema, yes? So if you have patients with edema, you know that this patient has more sodium than normal, yes? Of course, it's not absolutely true, for unfortunately, the edema can be done also by the lack of albumin, yes? So unfortunately, these signs aren't on 100% sure, but they are better, much, much, much better than the serum sodium. Yes, it tells you about the total body stores, nothing. 
And before the break, last thing, are chlorides. Chlorides are the main extracellular anion. The concentration is about 100. In intracellular fluid, we have lower concentration is about five, yes? So you see big red ion, the same as for sodium. If we are speaking about chlorides, many functions of chlorides are related to sodium, yes? For when you move with sodium, you move not only with water, but also with chlorides. Yes, for if you change if you change the location of plus charge, you have to change the location of some minus charge. Yes. You know, sodium can be accompanied by two anions, by chlorides or by bicarbonate. And these two acids are very, very different. For chlorides, they are anions of strong acid. <coughs> and bicarbonates are anions of weak acid. And these two anions can change their concentration ratios. So if you change the amount of anion of strong acid, it will change the concentration of the hydrogen protons also. So chlorides have very big importance for the acid-base balance in the body, yes? We'll speak about it next week. Other function of chlorides are simple. They form the gastric juice. And from immunology, you know that chlorides uh, can be used in our phagocytes to kill the bacteria. yes? For from chlorides, you produce hypochlorous acid, yes? So these are four functions of chlorides. And the last note, we have no hormone that regulates directly the concentration of chlorides. There is no hormone that can increase the concentration or decrease the concentration. Yes, everything is done secondary through sodium. So if aldosterone changes the concentration of sodium, it will influence also the concentration of chlorides. And the same for natriuretic polypeptides. Yes? So no direct hormone for chlorides. What was our ABB? ABB is acid-base balance. So that's, do you have questions to this? So if not, then we have break till 30. To intracellular cations, potassium and magnesium. So potassium is the main intracellular cation. About 98% of all potassium is inside the cell. Yes, the concentration of potassium in the cell is about 155 millimoles. In extracellular fluid, we have only 2% of total potassium and the concentration there is about 3.8 to 5.2. If you see the big difference, 98% in, uh, inside the cells, 2% outside the cells, and from the lab you gain only the concentration in plasma, you see that the concentration of plasma cannot tell you nothing about the total potassium stores, yes? that it's very insensitive value. Yes, for 98% you have in cells and that you cannot measure. You measure only the small amount that you have in plasma. Yes. Where we take or where we gain the potassium, you know potassium is especially in fruit and vegetable. Do you know in what fruit we have the highest amount of bananas. bananas are on the second place but it's also good was on the first place <coughs> it's the orange thing Mandarin. not that <laughs> that also not in we also can grow it in Czech Republic we have peaches and uh, more orange thing are apricots 
Yes, apricots, they have the highest, concent not concentration, the highest amount of potassium. And uh, for there you have hundreds of millimoles of potassium in apricots, yes. If you see that normally the intake is about 50 to 150 millimoles, so if you eat about one kilogram of apricot, you will develop very, very severe hyper uh, kalemia, hyperkalemia, yes. And every year we have in summer uh, months, we have several episodes when some old patients eat a lot of apricots, they develop some arrhythmias and they have to be taken to the coronary unit okay. due to that, yes? That's, that's only though the kidneys don't work properly. Very often. Very often if you are nor in normal adults, it's no matter for you can excrete also hundreds of milligrams mm -hmm. of potassium, but if the uh, older patients, they have slight change in the kidneys, nothing severe, yes, they aren't able to increase excretion. Yes, therefore it's typical for older patients in summer months, yes, especially September, September or August, where we have a lot of apricots, yes. Uh, so you as a doctor, of course, that the best way how to do this substitution is by some natural sources, yes. So very often the doctors, when they see that the patient has low kalemia, they said to them, so you should eat more fruit, bananas, or apricot, but you have to say them not more than two bananas per day, yes. For the old patients are sometimes able to eat a lot of banana, yes, when the doctor said to them, yes. <laughs> Maybe that there, there should be some regulation by European Union, yes, for it's very danger fruit. How we lose uh, potassium, majority of potassium is lost from kidneys, yes. Normally it's about 40 millimoles, but we can excrete hundreds of millimoles. If everything is good, our kidneys can excrete a lot of potassium. Here I will show you one big difference and I think that you already know it so I will only repeat it. We will compare two values and here two values. These are serum concentrations of sodium, serum concentrations of potassium and the same for urinary concentrations, yes? If you do the division and you will calculate the ratio you see that the serum Sodium potassium ratio is about 32 to 1. And the urinary ratio is 2 to 3 to 1. So you see that our kidneys are organ that reabsorb a lot of sodium and secrete a lot of potassium. Yes? That kidney is the organ that when everything works good has to excrete a lot of potassium. Yes? Therefore, if the kidneys have some problem, the concentration that of ions that rows rapidly is especially the potassium concentration. Yes? You know, if you want to change the concentration of sodium, of potassium in the plasma, you have two ways. The first is that you change the total amount of potassium in the body. Yes? But this is quite difficult. For if you know that 98% of all potassium is normally in the cells, so you have to eat a lot of potassium to increase the concentration in blood. Yes? For the majority of the potassium intake will go into the cells. Yes? So it's a very small increase. If you want to do a rapid increase or decrease, it's better to change the distribution. It means the portion of intracellular and the portion of extracellular, yes? And the majority of changes that you as a doctor you will see are these problems, yes? This is only for patients with kidney problem or with patients with apricot poisoning, 
yes? But the majority is this. So the majority of disturbances of plasma potassium is done by problems in distribution, yes? So it's not 98 to 2, but it will be, for example, 95 to 5, yes? And this small change can rapidly increase the concentration of potassium. So how it works? It's that you know that the cell has the mechanism to keep the proper arrangement of ions outside and inside, yes? The concentration of potassium is controlled by one pump, by the sodium-potassium pump. And this pump is responsible for the proper arrangement. So sodium outside, potassium inside. Very often the hyperkalemia develops when these pumps do not work properly. Yes? It means potassium will be still in extracellular fluid and it cannot be transported to the cell. Yes? Um, when you have this... Yeah, question. Uh, what do you mean? When glucose enters the cell... I will go to that. Okay, so I am now here. I will do to this and this. How you can change the function of NAK ATPase? We have some drugs, but that's not very common. Also a bit, but the main thing, it has to be quite common. Yes, if the majority of causes are here. The ATP can be the problem. Yes, for you have many patients that have hypoxia through the body, yes? Yes, they have bad function of the heart, yes? Therefore, they are per, uh, their blood perfusion is not very good, and the cells are missing oxygen. If the cells are missing oxygen, they do not have enough ATP, yes? So all states when you are missing ATP are connected with the potassium disturbances, you have more potassium outside, yes? For NAK ATPase needs energy to keep the proper arrangement. If there is lack of ATP, sodium will be inside the cell and potassium outside the cell. Yes? For example, hypoxia is a typical sign. If you have some infarction, the cells are missing oxygen and they release a lot of potassium or they aren't able to reabsorb it back inside. How works pH? You know, our cells works as a, work as a very big buffer, yes? How it works is that if you have a lot of hydrogen protons during acidosis in the blood, cells will take this hydrogen proton inside. And to keep the normal arrangement of cations on the <coughs> membrane, they have to release some cations and what cation they have, they have potassium. So during acidosis, there is a shift, protons inside the cells and potassium outside. So acidosis is connected with hyperkalemia and opposite effect in alkalosis, you have hyperkalemia. Is that main release with magnesium also? <coughs> Not so many. Especially, it's true that's a bit, but more it's the potassium. Potassium is the problem. Magnesium is not a problem. And what's this? Why insulin and glucose? There are two effects of insulin and glucose on the potassium level. One direct, the second is indirect. The indirect effect is glucose is a nutrient. So if you give nutrient to the cell, we are the insulin, the cell has energy, <coughs> yes? There's the first effect, so when you give infusion of insulin plus glucose, you will give energy to the cell, and the cell can feed the NAK AT pace. And therefore it can decrease the blood concentration of, uh, of potassium. Then there is the direct effect that's not very good uh, described, 
but we know that only the pure infusion of insulin and glucose somehow enables the transport of potassium inside. Yes, the cells take the potassium, yes, directly. We do not know how it works, whether there is some channel that is connected to GLUT4 transporter that we do not know. Yes, but there are two effects, how glucose and insulin decreases uh, the plasma concentration of potassium. And this is the way how you as a doctor will decrease hyperkalemia. You will give the infusion of insulin plus glucose and the potassium level will decrease. Yes, that's the easiest way. Done by almost all doctors that know about it. So maybe not on dermatology. So was it the answer? Yeah. Here we have described the process, so I will skip it. So if we should repeat the regulation of potassium, there are two levels of regulations. One level of regulation is here. The shifts between intracellular and extracellular potassium. Yes? There's the first. And the second, you can regulate the excretion of potassium in kidneys. This you will do by aldosterone. Aldosterone is hormone that secrete potassium and reabsorbs sodium. There is no effective hormone uh, for sodium absorption, sorry, for uh, potassium absorption. Yes? Only aldosterone excretion of sodium, of potassium in this little tube. Here you can see what happens if the, there is the disturbance between intracellular and extracellular potassium, yes? If there is some problem, if you have less extracellular potassium, or if you have more extracellular potassium, it will change the function of uh, many tissues, especially about the tissues that do the actual potential, for you know that potassium is important for the repolarization phase in actual potential. <coughs> and the best sign that you can see is this. So it's EKG. And you see here the changes on the EKG during hypokalemia and during hyperkalemia, yes? <coughs> and very often the cardiologist, when they see some strange EKG, there is no infarction, no markers for infarction. They wait till the laboratory results arrive and they look at the value of kalemia, yes? for many arrhythmias are due to disturbances in potassium level, yes? Magnesium, magnesium is the second main intracellular cation. The concentration in plasma is about one and magnesium has many, many functions in the body. From the biochemical point of view, it's a factor of more than 300 enzymes, yes? So it has a very wide effect on our metabolism. Also, magnesium has its role in excitatory tissues. You know, magnesium has, the role of magnesium is that it can change the permeability of, for example, uh, calcium channels for calcium. So if we have more magnesium, then less calcium can go in the cells, and therefore the muscular excitability is lower than normal. Yes? So you can say that it stabilizes the excitatory tissues. Yes, for the flow of cations in the cell is not so strong, yes? This effect is used in the medicine.
for, in, for some patients, we need to give them infusion of magnesium sulfate. It means we will do the artificial hypermagnesemia. It's used especially of patients that have higher neuromuscular excitability, yes? Especially it's used for the treatment of preeclampsia. Do you know what is it? It's the, unfortunately today, still more and more common uh, disease during pregnancy. Uh, you know, during pregnancy, some women develop hypertension. Yes, it's gestationally uh, hypertension, and uh, we do not know why. Yes, we think that there is some disturbance in calcium metabolism, but we do not know why. And this preeclampsia, it's not only hypertension, but it's connected with the episodes of seizures. Yes, at the end, if you do not treat it, uh, they can develop something that is very similar to epileptic seizure, yes? And this seizure can kill the mother together with the child, yes? And the prevalence of the hypertension is about 5%. So it's very, very high. And quite effective treatment is this infusion, yes? For Magnesium sulfate decreases the blood pressure and also decreases the excitability, yes? About calcium, or do you have questions to potassium and magnesium? Calcium. We'll go back to extracellular space. For calcium, the majority of calcium is in extracellular space, yes? 99% of all calcium is in bones, yes? In form of hydroxyapatite. The concentration in intracellular fluid is very, very low. It's about 10 to minus 8. <coughs> so if you compare it with Extracellular concentration that is 2.2 to 2.75. This is very, 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 very low concentration. Yes? 10 to minus 4. Yes, is this difference. This distribution is very, very important. Yes, it's the biggest gradient for all ions. Yes? Biggest gradient have calcium. What roles of calcium in the body we know? So we know that majority of calcium, about one kilogram of calcium we have in bones. You know that calcium is important for muscle contraction. You know that calcium is important not only for muscle contraction, but also for the processes that are, for example, uh, release of neurotransmitters, yes? Without calcium, you cannot do coagulation. You know that the easiest way how to stop blood clotting is to remove calcium, yes? If you remove calcium, you can have plasma, yes? So no, um, no blood clot. Why is there so big difference for intracellular and extracellular concentration? is for calcium has many roles inside the cell. You know that calcium inside the cell is signal molecules, yes? A signal molecule, and concentration of signal molecules normally is very low, yes? Concentration of hormones that in, that's in millimoles, not in millimoles, but it's in micromoles and nanomoles. Yes, therefore the concentration of <coughs> calcium is so low in the cell, for, for cells it's a signal molecule and concentration of signal molecules has to be very, very low. To keep this small concentration, we have two transporters in the membrane. First is secondary active transport with sodium. One calcium cation is transported out the cell and three Sodium cations go inside the cell. 
yes? So it's sodium calcium antiport. Second transporter is active transport and it's calcium pump. So you consume ATP and you transport calcium out the cell. The problem is when you do not do this. If you increase the concentration of calcium in the cell, you will start some positive processes. It's the release of neurotransmitters, muscle contraction, you can regulate some pathways. You know that, for example, glycogenolysis is regulated by calcium, yes? During muscle contraction, you need energy. So in muscle cell, glycogenolysis is controlled by the level of calcium inside, yes? But if you have high concentration of calcium for a long time in the cell, then it will show you the harm effects. It activates many enzymes. I think that you know better than I the role of calcium in apoptosis. Yes? How is calcium important for apoptosome? Simply we can say that calcium activates some enzymes. One example are phospholipases that start to degradate some compounds that are signals for the cell that something is buried inside me and I should commit a suicide, yes? This discovery was very, very important. Uh, why important? For before 30 years, we very often as a doctors increased the concentration of intracellular calcium. Especially it was the story of treatment of heart failure. There was one drug that was called Digoxin, and this drug increases the concentration of intracellular calcium. What was the effect? The heart was stronger, yes? The pump may, uh, works better. But then it was discovered that the patients on digoxin die sooner. And the expression is here for we increase the intracellular calcium, it means we increase the strength of the beat, but also we increase the apoptosis, yes? And therefore nowadays we do not give digoxin, for we know that calcium have two sides, one good side, uh, but the other it's apoptosis side, yes? The regulation of calcium, I think you know good, for you had special lecture from physiology from it, yes? There are three hormones, parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, and active vitamin D, it means calcitriol. Parat hormone releases, uh, releases calcium and phosphates from bones, and then block the secretion of calcium in kidneys. Calcitonin has opposite effect. It decreases the concentration of uh, calcium, but you know that calcitonin in humans is not very effective hormone. So the second effective hormone together with parathyroid hormone is vitamin D in active form calcitriol. And vitamin D increases the resorption of calcium from uh, small intestine and also from kidneys. Yes? This is a very favorite question, regulation of calcium. Yes. Very often also the last question during the exam. And the last, phosphate. Phosphate is very important intracellular anion. It's the main buffer in intracellular fluid. Yes? In extracellular fluid, the main buffer is bicarbonate. In cells, it's phosphate together with proteins. Other roles of phosphates, of course, it's together with calcium in bones. And then you know many, many organic compounds where you can find phosphate. 
You can find it in DNA. You can find it in ATP, in phospholipids, and many, many other things. Yes? So, if you are missing phosphate, when you have lack of phosphate, there is no one sign that you can show. Yes? It's a wide, wide range of signs for the whole metabolism works bad. Together, there are problems in bones. But it's very difficult to say this patient has problem with phosphate. Yes? The only marker that you have is the level of phosphate in blood. But for its intracellular anion, it tells you almost nothing. Yes? So that's this lecture. <laughs>